no matter what you do Baby, I'll be there for you You can depend on me, yeah There's no need for you to cry Cause I'll be right there for you Welcome back inside our pagoda, and how many times have we heard those words during the last two and a half weeks? We're at the now nearly empty Seoul Sports Complex. The games have been over for less than 72 hours, but some stories and images will last forever. These Olympics had their share of controversies, and no venue had more curious happenings than the Chamshil Students Gymnasium, where the two boxing rings often took on the characteristics of a three-ring circus. The boxing big top was the scene of heartbreak for some athletes and piqued the resentment of many Koreans toward Americans. You have bees, the bus you have bees. Nobody can get on the bus. Okay, there's my athlete right there. Listen, let's proceed, let's proceed with the bouts and we'll take care of it, okay? Here's Anthony Hembrick right now walking into the arena. Let's proceed with the rest of the... Been waiting, we could have been there. Did you see the schedule? What does the schedule show? It's about number 11. Here. Now listen. We were coming at 10.30 because we had... Get the kid dressed, get him we're, ready we're to getting roll. Him, we're getting okay. him dressed. Hey. See, nevertheless, all the other uh, delegations that had boxes on ring A or B, they uh, understood this program correctly. It is something that is hard to deal with. I grabbed him and I hugged him and I said, I'm very sorry. And I'll accept responsibility. Hit me, kick me, whatever you want to do. You know, but uh, uh, just something that's happened is unfortunate. Yeah. Things turned uglier three days later when a fiercely partisan crowd saw Korea's Beyond Jong Il lose a 4-1 decision to Bulgarian flyweight Alexander Ristov. In the red corner, Alexander Ristov, Bulgaria. Keith Walker is getting punched by the cornerman. This is ugly. Beyond staged a sit-down protest and referee Keith Walker left for his native New Zealand. And I have to bow out on the belt. It was a complete disaster. In, in, in respect of the crowd's reaction to it. I, I, I really don't believe that I did a, did a bad job. It was a two-ring circus when light welterweight Chun Jin Shul heard the bell from the other ring. Chun dropped his hands. Todd Foster dropped Chun with a left. It was ruled a no contest and a refight over the objections of the U.S. team. It's not right. Well, I, I'm going to protest. I'm going to protest. Right here he is told that he would have to get back in the ring again with Chun. And so he made his way to the locker room, and uh, that would set up uh, part two of this uh, weird boxing doubleheader. Oh, but Chun able to come back. Well, his legs are spaghetti right now. And down he goes! Todd Foster set it up with a shot to the body, and then connected on Chun. It's all over! And this time, Foster had won outright. Now, Roy Jones controlled his light middleweight title fight against Korea's Park Si-hun, scoring with an aggressive, punishing, and powerful style. Well, if he doesn't win the goal off this, then I think there's something rotten in Korea because that is absolutely one of the most dominant things I've seen. The winner seen. is on point three two in the blue corner. Well, there. Said Roy Jones Sr., I've never seen him shed a tear before. Chargers of judging incompetence couldn't bring back the gold for Jones, but there was an interesting postscript. The International Amateur Boxing Association named him the outstanding fighter in the Olympics, although he settled for silver. We're joined now by the American ambassador to Korea, James Lilly. Ambassador Lilly, at least on some occasions, we saw Korean spectators rooting against the United States, specifically against the United States, sometimes pointedly for the Soviet Union. And they seem to be, at least from our perspective, uh, overly upset by what we would view as fairly routine reporting of controversies within the ring. They took it to be uh, some sort of national dishonor. How strong is the tide of anti-Americanism here now? I don't think it's that Im strong. It seems to me that the Koreans are very upfront people. If they think something, they let you know. It's very refreshing for us who deal often with very devious cultures. With the Koreans, it's right up front. They feel it, out it comes. And I think that's one of their most charming characteristics. It affects you in negative ways because it bursts out in a highly tense sport like boxing 
where you have violence, where you have judgmental decisions, and we have a very strong feeling that the stakes are enormously high. So the concept of lo losing face before the world, the concept of having a superb effort go into these Olympics and having it stained, very volatile mix. I'm sure you can envision someone watching this at home in the States and saying, hold on here, even considering all those things, 50,000 Americans died here uh, in the early 1950s, an American military presence remains, we've helped this country economically, we don't ever expect to hear a cry of Yankee go home from the Koreans. We've heard Yankee go home all over the world, from Greece to Spain to England to Germany, every country has it. In fact, the polls tell us that 80% of the Koreans support the security arrangement. They look, perhaps people do lose their tempers from time to time. That's natural, where you have a big mix of the two societies. But it seems to me that there's a very strong commitment here to the basic relationship with the United States. And I think that is reflected in all the objective criteria that we examine. Are we a victim to a certain extent of the success of our own policy? We help them. They develop economically, and then inevitably, there's the resentment that is felt by the emerging junior partner toward the senior partner. This whole modernization has been at a breathtaking pace, and it's crystallized in the Olympics. The tensions built up in rapid urbanization are enormous, and there can be explosions, as there are all over Korea. But I will say that the demonstrations that you've seen, the firebombs, have been very much distorted by the foreign press. Those are very minor incidents in a very large city, and it has not been a good chapter in our coverage of Korea. This is basically a clean and stable society. Have they accomplished what they set out to do with these games, not just from an athletic standpoint, uh, but in the sense of moving themselves into a very prominent position on the international stage in a way that will last beyond these Olympic Games? I think there's absolutely no question of that. These were f incredibly successful games. The sportsmanship, the good crowds, overwhelmed the bad crowds. 70,000 people in that sports stadium, impeccable, cordial, friendly, hospitable. In basketball, volleyball, boxing even that I saw, excellent sportsmanship, swimming, diving. The few minor instances where there was this outbreak were just that, very, very minor. And we can't dwell on the negative. We have to be very brief here, no time yeah. to cover all the interesting aspects, but how long might it be before the military presence, the American military presence here, is reduced or eliminated? I think that depends squarely on North Korea. You have a great array of forces in the North facing the South. The Americans provide the balance between the two. It seems to me if the North has verifiable reductions, moves in the direction of North-South dialogue, talks, improvement relations. And they say that might happen. Both sides that express might a willingness. Then you can think about it. But to do it prematurely, to do it unilaterally, to me is irresponsible. Ambassador Lilly, thanks very much. And now in a rather abrupt departure, we move back to the story of the competitive aspects of these games, beginning with the American boxers.